Kalyan Moy Dev, who is one of the major global innovators on multi objective design optimization. Um, uh, I've followed his work for a very long time, and actually, we were both mentored. He was advised by David Goldberg at Alabama and did a postdoc at Illinois. I was a pesky engineer who walked down Matthew Street that kept knocking on Dave Goldberg's door, and he was on my committee. Uh, so we have a University of Illinois connection there. He went on to Cancun, uh, and now he's at Michigan State as an endowed professor. He has won about every major multi-objective prize that you can think of. He is one of the most cited people uh, in academia right now, and I believe the most cited Indian scientist in the world. Uh, you may have heard of such things as NHG 2. If you've heard of that, I would encourage you to check out NHG 3, uh, which is very powerful. And so with that, what's really nice, and I think fits well with the systems seminar here, is that Kalyan has always been on the frontier of theory, but he's also been thinking through the lens of application and a very systems focus on what what problems can you not attain presently and where can you go to attain them? So, with that, thank you very much. Thank you, Greg. I'm uh, very glad to be here. Uh, we've been thinking of, of this visit for some time, uh, but finally, on a very nice sunny day, I'm glad that so many people decided to be here and not outside. Uh, hopefully, uh, you will get an idea of what I have been working on um, for quite a number years now. Uh, so, nice for, thanks for the nice introduction, <coughs> um, So, what I'm going to do is... Um, well, Excuse me, is your microphone on? Oh, sorry. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so what I'm going to do is um, just run, run you down with some problems that often we face in engineering, which sometimes we don't realize that what kind of problem <coughs> is that. So, when you're in systems engineering, that's the first thing that you need to look at is, can I use this method or can I use that method? Is it really falls into the category of optimization or is it a root finding or is it that I need to just solve the PD uh, equation solver and then I get some uncertainty that's good enough? So, so, so I'm going to run you down with different problems that you can solve using an optimization method. Not necessarily the most efficient way, but if you know optimization methods, this could be in your purview. Uh, then I'll talk very briefly about evolutionary optimization. That's something that uh, he mentioned about Dave Goldberg. Uh, it started from University of Michigan with John Holland. Unfortunately, he just passed away last month. Uh, but he, he started working on what he called genetic algorithm back in 1960s, early 60s. Now they're more popularly known as evolutionary algorithms. Uh, so uh, I have been responsible for starting some of these work very early, uh, about more than 22 years ago, on, on EMO, evolutionary multi-criteria and optimization. And I'm glad that, that it has taken off. A lot of people are finding them useful, both in research as well as in applications. Uh, and then how EMO is going to be useful in, in, in various kinds of design and optimization problems. Uh, I, I also, I'm also not interested in just finding an optimal solutions, but uh, the learning aspects from it. So that's, I think, very important uh, for, for, a, for, for you to be a good researcher and a good engineer, that you just don't solve the problem, but you also gain some insight of how you have solved the problem, so that next time you get a similar problem to solve, you are already ahead from your competitor or others that in the field. Um, so this wicked problem solving is, is something that's getting quite uh, into prominence in society because there are lots of problems which falls into these categories. There are few descriptions uh, that make a problem wicked. And unfortunately, uh, these kinds of problem solving methods we cannot teach uh, in, a, in a university setup because everyone will, one simple reason is that everyone will come up with a different solution and there is no right or wrong answer this, so it will be a very hard time for us to grade if all of you <laughs> in my class and coming up with the different solutions. But this is what is practice all about. So when you get out from here, the university and try start solving problems, that's what you are going to have. So again, know that there is no right or wrong answer. It's just the way that you come up with some solutions, which needs to be vetoed and approved by for whom you're solving them. So that's the main thing. So uh, oftentimes, it's good to know that there is no one answer to most of the societal problems. I'm, I'm going to show you through an example. Okay, so let's go with this rundown list that I usually do. 
So all kinds of design uh, problems that any discipline that you are in from. So that's where the systems thinking come very nicely here. We can, I can put everything under one topic or systems design. Uh, and of course, manufacturing processes. So anything you see here, there are parameters, there are shapes uh, that you need to come up with. And, and, and there are some standard ways people do it. But if you put them under a very general framework and apply an optimization engine to come up with good solutions, you may be surprised. You may get something that you've never seen before. And oftentimes, we see that. Or it can be that you have already designed and focused on a shape, and you're, all, you're interested in what kind of thicknesses or weld thickness and other things that you <coughs> want to do. So that you can get down the optimization at various levels. Um, so there are many other problems that are uh, uh, you know, uh, good for, for, for the optimization to be used. One is inverse problems. So we often call them the problems from tomography reconstructions, where you have the, for example, 2D structures of a brain. And then you have to construct the 3D structure out of that. So every pixel needs to be connected from frame to frame so that there is a meaning at the end. So uh, usually it's an error minimization kind of problem. But this inverse problem solving is getting very popular uh, from different fields. And optimization comes in a major way in solving them. Uh, we often do this kind of uh, graph plotting of seeing you know, when I get some experimental results uh, and I want to see what kind of regression fate is good. Actually, when you're fitting a linear curve or line to a set of points, at the background of that software, it's using actually um, a, a, an optimization method, okay, or least square uh, uh, method of finding which line is going to minimize the overall error. So now you can take this idea and say, I have a surface to be fit, or some, some curve, not a line. Uh, if you don't find the software, you can actually take help of optimization method and come up with a description of parametric description of that surface and then try to fit the car through, through error minimization process. Or you're doing scientific experiments, which could be very expensive, either cost-wise or time-wise. Uh, then you've got already, let's say, 20 different uh, experiments done. You want to do the 21st one. You don't want to do it at a random place. You want to make sure that you get uh, quite a bit of information coming out of your past 20 experiments and figure out where should you put the 21st one so that you get maximum information out of it. So that task is also falls into an optimization category. And of course, there's a, there's a big chunk of work that goes in modeling, uh, <coughs> systems modeling, is through optimization. So you have complex systems that we have in, in, in practice. Uh, and there are a lot of inputs that goes into the system. There are maybe one or two outputs that come out of it. So your goal is to really find out um, how my output quality is related to the input. And sometimes even now, after even more than 100 years of still making, uh, they, the metallurgists don't know exactly what are the equations, what are the mathematical models inside the blast furnace. But still, they're still, still produced. They are used in bridges and structures. We, we live on them. We, we drive through them. Uh, but you know that 100% of stuff that goes inside is not known. Uh, but so, so that's not stopping us of doing anything, right? So we still try to do a good modeling of all those unknown stuff that is there either through a set of equations that, that tells us from our science that how things are getting formed. Or if we don't have that kind of knowledge, uh, we try to use artificially through neural nets or other kind of systems where there is a relationship between input and output we try, we try to capture. Now, it, both these processes involve some kind of optimization process because when you get these equations, they deliberately put some Greek letters like this, and, and then say, OK, we don't know these letters. We need to find what should be values of this so that the output of this mathematical system matches well with the actual output of the system. So then for, for all interpolation purposes, you have a model then which matches well with the practice. Okay? So you can then use it for other purposes. Same thing over here. So the way you drive at getting these values is through an optimization process. OK. Um, then there are other kinds of problems like scheduling and combinatorial optimization, where a traveling salesperson, for example, has to travel to various towns and cities to sell something. Uh, now, how, how the person would decide what path to take, or routing. So these are, or classroom timetabling. Uh, these are different kinds of optimization problems, or supply chain management. Um, Control system problems for optimal control uh, have different kinds of variables. Here, the variables are not just crisp number of 
of dimensions or something like that. Here, you have a parameter like temperature or pressure that changes with time, for example. Uh, the temperature that can be across the furnace length. So, uh, so it's a profile that you're trying to find. So one solution is one such profile. Another solution would be slightly different profile, and so on and so forth. So at the end of your optimization task, you're trying to find out what, what profile is going to make your uh, some performance <coughs> metric best in some sense. So you, 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 you achieve the task <coughs> with, the, with the smallest amount of time or with, with, the, with the highest quality and, and whatever you may think of. Uh, other kinds of optimization problems are forecasting and predictions where you have a set of data and then you try to understand and model the data and then use that to predict of how the future is going to be like. So weather, weather prediction, market predictions, these are more lucrative use of optimization <coughs> if you're interested. Data mining and big data is another area where optimization is an integral part because data comes from various sources. So first thing that you have to do is to cluster them, say, OK, this data from that place is equivalent to that data from that place. Okay, So first thing you need to do is this clustering of all these data with respect to, again, some features and, and, and performance measures. Uh, or uh, prediction and, and then pattern recognition. So these are uh, different kinds of machine learning problems where optimization comes in very, very often. Uh, so the idea here is to design with uh, and come up with an intelligent system. So this word intelligent system or, or anything intelligence is really related to the optimal solutions of that search space because the optimal solutions in the search space are not any arbitrary solutions. These are special solutions that minimizes or maximizes certain objectives. So if you look for those solutions, what are they and what kind of properties are preserved in them, that can give you a lot of insights of how to create an intelligent system. All right, so if you look at many of these problems that I just listed, um, you don't expect this problem to be differentiable. Sometimes you cannot even write a mathematical function uh, with respect to the variables that you may have in, in those problems. They, they are likely to be discontinuous, discrete, mixed in nature. Uh, some variables are integer, some variables are continuous, some are permutation type large dimensions. Oftentimes, we, we solve problems that are tens of thousands of variables. I will show you one application where you dealt with a million variable problems. So it's, it's a huge search space, often if you're interested in practical problem solving. Constraints and objectives can be many as well. Objectives, you don't expect to be million objectives. But uh, at least 5, 6 to 10, 15 objectives can be common. Uh, but we are there now. But we are also thinking of problems having, let's say, 100 objectives then what do you do? It turns out the methods we have now uh, may not be so effective when you go, to, go up to that level. So, so this, these algorithms that we have in optimization don't even scale up uh, from 1 to 2 or even 2 to 5 or something and then 5 to 50. So you need to think of different ways of solving them. Uh, constraints, if they are nonlinear, if they're linear, they're very sometimes helpful uh, to be used in your algorithm. But if they're nonlinear, they really make your life miserable. So how do you want to handle these constraints in an efficient way, in a generic way? Uh, these are some questions. Multimodalities. I'll show you a problem, very simple problem from a power plant. And you see how difficult, how many uh, modes or optima this pro problem has. And oftentimes, there are numerous um, local optima that you're not interested. But the problem has that. So your algorithm has to avoid all that and eventually get to the good solutions that, uh, that you are interested in. And of course, I'm going to concentrate more on the multi-objective aspects of the problems where there are more than one objective that are in conflict to each other. Uncertainties in variables. I mean, anybody's solving problems from real world, you can't avoid uncertainty because nothing is fixed in, in real world. So if you know that the problems, the variables, the parameters come with some uncertainty, there are ways you can handle them within the optimization algorithm. So your algorithm gets little different from the, the, the way you handle if this was, this was a deterministic problem. But there are methodologies that are available, and then we should be able to uh, handle those things. And then lots of problems that we solve are computationally expensive. Each evaluation can take a few minutes to hours, sometimes a day or more than a day. So then uh, if you have to use, if use an optimization methods to solve those problems, you can imagine how, to, how computationally expensive that can be. So you have to use software, hardware solutions to these, to handling these kinds of problems. 
And then, of course, multidisciplinarity, because you are solving a problem for not for one discipline, from one discipline point of view. There are various uh, uh, disciplines come in, and you have to, it has to be true or it has to be an optimal with respect to all these different disciplines. So you need to cross talk between departments, between different groups, uh, because one person is not uh, expected to be an expert in all the disciplines. Okay? So it's a collaborative activity that needs to be uh, acted eventually. So if you look at all these different problems, they would be different from each other. An algorithm that you've derived for one method, or one problem, sorry, uh, will probably not like to be very efficient for another problem. So they, uh, there will be difference in the problems are different, the algorithms should also be different. What you need is a flexible, adaptive, and customized algorithm. So you need to be able to have an algorithm that can be easily changed from one kinds of problem solving to the next. It should be adaptive so it can do something on its own instead of every time we are intervening. And it should be customized because uh, otherwise it's very difficult. And there's a theoretical motivation for the customization. We have what is known as the NFL theorem, the no free lunch theorem, that actually says that you cannot have one optimization algorithm to solve all problems. So that actually tells us that we need to customize. Okay. All right, so I'm going to be uh, advocating you uh, or uh, all, the, all the methods that I, uh, the problems that I'm, I'll be showing you are solved using majority of those problems solved using evolutionary optimization problem. Uh, you may have taken a course here because I think uh, there, there are opportunities for you to learn here and, and of course there are a lot of stuff out there. So the main motivation comes from nature and the way nature solves problems. If you see around us lots of designs that look optimal, right? Some of these, for example, these hexagonal shape can be shown to be an optimal shape, right? So, uh, so how does the bee, bee know about that? Because they don't know how to differentiate. Okay, a problem, but they eventually, with trial and error, figured this out. Uh, the only problem is they took lots of years to solve this problem. We don't have that luxury. So we need to understand that process and maybe speed up, okay, somehow. So, so that's what we do in this evolutionary optimization algorithm. So there are, so I'll show you the basic structure of this kind of an optimization method where uh, you start with a set of solutions uh, we call initial population. This could be randomly created, or, or, or if you're solving a practical problems, I wouldn't, I wouldn't advise you to do random, because oftentimes in problems we can figure out a way to create good solutions. They may not be optimum, but you can come up with some ways of create good solutions. So that's your initial set. And so in this particular algorithm, we don't go point by point by point, rather a population to another population to another population. So all you have to do now from the population, each member has to be evaluated for are they feasible or not. So, so you, after you've done that, then you use a selection operation to choose the good solutions out of it, that population, and then use that good population members and apply with some variation operator. So that's where you use recombination and mutation-like operators uh, to create a new population, which we call an offspring population. In this sketch, I'm showing you those as with open circles. And so these are called offspring populations, and these solid ones we call parent population. And then we combine them together, so evaluate the offspring ones, and then you evaluate, and then we combine them together and apply a survivor operator to say which ones out of these two n population will survive. So it could be that this few from the offspring and these two from the parent survives, and the others are deleted. So now you have the new population, you go back to the, your original loop, and then keep moving that way, okay? So it's a very flexible environment. You can change things around a little bit. Uh, the, 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 the main point here is there's no gradient or anything we're using, but if you're dealing with a problem where objective functions are defined, constants are defined, and you can differentiate them easily, you can use them in your recombination metrics. Nothing is you know, objecting you to do that, but oftentimes we don't have that luxury because we can't simply take a differentiation of that. So we use some generic methods or some problem-specific informations. So when I talked about customization, I talked about customizing initial population, customizing a termination condition, customizing operators here like selection, recombination, mutation, and survivor. Okay? So it's a very flexible environment, but the onus is on the users to make it right. Okay? So that's where there has to be some kind of research, some understanding of the interaction <coughs> among all these operators if you want to create it nice. But if you can create that nice, 
uh, these combinations for a problem, you can really jump into the search space towards the optimum. I'll show you some results. Um, now, um, the, okay, so uh, you can handle real variables or discrete variables. There are some operators that has been developed for that. Uh, if you're doing real parameters, if you have two <coughs> solutions, you can use some kind of a blending operations that works with the probability distribution to create a new solutions, or you can create your own ways uh, of, of, of solutions. So then comes the constraints. Um, you should have, again, try to have it as parameterless as possible. So in 2000, I suggested a method which is called parameterless approach, uh, where there is no parameter in this approach because you are dealing with a population. So, so we have kind of exploited the evolutionary optimization's population idea to come up with a constraint handling method that's generic and does not require any parameter. But you know, in both this, both this problem, you see in one case the optimum is here, the other case the optimum is there because I changed the sign of this constraint. And the same algorithm without any other parameter works differently because it says what is feasible here is no more feasible there. So that definition is changed, but the algorithm takes that information and finds the new optimum. Okay, these are not only solved for two variable, three variable problem uh, uh, as, I, as I showed you so far, but these are actually solved to, 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 to solve some real world problems. Like here is the Japan Shinkansen, the nose of this bullet train is designed using genetic algorithm. Uh, not to be fancy, but they tried some classical methods that, that, that they were using, and they didn't provide the solutions that they were happy with, because they, once they get the design, they actually go to wind tunnel and test, and they, they fail those tests. And then they heard of GA, and they used to found something that worked. And most likely what happened in those cases is the classical methods have got stuck into some local solutions that were not meeting the global goals that they had in mind. Since ge genetic algorithms work with the population concept, they were more likely to give a global solution. There is Kone's elevator system. Uh, they have introduced that in every Kone system since 1995. Every half a second, uh, uh, they get all the calls at various floors. People are pressing a button. That information comes to a central system, and it decides which car should go to which floor. Okay, so, uh, so there's this landing call allocation as you see, is using genetic algorithm. I've been doing since 1995. It's, it's actually hard-coded into the chips, and they're using since 1995. Now, Mitsubishi Regional Jet, uh, this aircraft is going to come up soon in this month or next month. Uh, much of the design, including the shape and inside uh, uh, stuff, is designed using genetic algorithms in, in hybridization with other methods as well. OK, so let me get into some of my work. So here. Um, is a, is a problem that came from Endesa, the Spain's uh, power company. Uh, so uh, they, want, they were going for solar. This was about four or five years ago. They were going for solar. And they take a simple model of their system. Uh, but the problem is they wouldn't give me the, the source code or any of these information. So they said, OK, there's a black box. So you give me a solution, and the black box will evaluate for its profit. They're trying to maximize profit for some reason. And then there are some <laughs> constraints that uh, need to be satisfied. So it will tell you whether the constraints are satisfied or not. Or if it's not satisfied, how much constraint <coughs> violation there is. That's the, these are the two information that you get, nothing else. from. It. So you can't see the mathematical structure of the problem. So you can think of, is it a convex problem or a concave problem, or what, what shall I do? But the easy part is there are only three variables. I was thinking, three variables? Anybody can do it, right? So we hooked up GA with that. So as the GA solutions are coming out, we send to this evaluator. And it tells us that it's feasible or not. And then if it's feasible, what is the profit? And so we crank the method. So we change the algorithm a little bit. By the way, before I do GA, I actually pass it through some standard softwares that are available in the market. And both of these methods failed. Okay? Um, so there was a need for going in for something else. And we came up with a method. I'm not showing you, I'm not discussing the method in detail, but I'm going to show you. I'd run it 10 times. And here's the profit. It's in, in big number. But uh, look at the variation. I think up to four significant digits, they're exactly the same. It's about 0.0017% difference. So we, when you have such a method and you're giving to someone who has no idea about GA and you want them to run it every now and then, uh, you need to have such performance so that they don't have to run it 10 times. They can just run it once and get a good result. Our, our first version to this problem wasn't so. 
wasn't so. So there was about 1 to 2 percent difference that every time we run it. And 1 to 2 percent difference of such a number were coming out to be a highly significant number for them. So, um, so eventually we came up with such a method. And the solutions also converge to almost the same. But what I'm going to show you now, these three variables, but look at this one problem we got from an industry. And everything that you can think of is here. All the devils are here. Uh, so here is with respect to one variable. As we go from the some bound, some, some low value to a high value, look at how these function changes, the profit changes. There are lots of lots of local minima, maxima in this case, we are maximizing the profit. But if, if I sh give you this whole structure, you will see, ah, there is a general tendency, right? It's going up. So if I'm maximizing this, I should be on this side of this value that, that you can see. Only if you can see this, only if I, so if you have a thousand variable problem, I cannot plot this for you. It will take a lot of days for me to come up with such plot. But three variables, keeping two of them fixed, one of them varying, I can get an idea of what's going on. And I can also explain to you why some of these classical methods didn't work. Because if you start from here, you will climb up the hill and get stuck there. Because the algorithm says, oh, there is nothing in the neighborhood better than this solution. So the algorithm will stop. That's how we are getting, every time we run, we get a different result. So this explains why. Then if you take another variable, this is a peculiar one. This is really the global <coughs> test in the entire search space. But I wouldn't recommend this solution to anybody because it's very sensitive to getting that value exactly. There are two, three solutions right there. But if you cannot achieve that, you are back here. There are other solutions which are more robust. So I mentioned about uncertainty. So if that's existing in your problem, you can't just find the global best. You also have to see in the neighborhood what's happening if you cannot maintain it. Another variable, if I take, there's a discontinuity in this problem. So if you are coming from this side, this is the best solution. If you're coming from that side, that's the best solution. So your algorithm should be able to handle these continuities. I read a nice paper. Someone actually studied many optimization problems and came up with this conclusion that if your optimization problem has discontinuity, most likely it happens at the, at the optima. And this is one such case. That, uh, that this continuity can happen anywhere in your search space, right? But if it's at the optima, you're in trouble because now you have to come from the right side. And, and importantly, your derivative will not work at the discontinuity. So you need methods that, uh, that is beyond the derivatives. So in one problem, I found all these different difficulties that we talk about. Um, again, I've been getting a lot of questions about how big a problem have you solved with this method because they look like some game we are playing so one time I had an opportunity to work with the industry uh, which had a scalable problem. So they were, so it's a casting scheduling problem. Let me just explain to you what happens. Uh, they, they melt about 650 kilos of metal and then they have a lot of castings to be made from it. So you need to decide which one of them you make so that you maximally utilize the, the metal that you melted. So let's say 650 and you've got 10 of them done and you use 640. So 10 kilos is still staying in your vessel and there is no one which is less than 10 <coughs> kilos. So that's a waste in terms of heat, right? So if you planned it differently, maybe you could have used 645 kilos. So, but then if you do one time, you could do it maybe by hand or something. But if you're doing every hour one time and for months, you cannot do it by hand. So that was the problem that, uh, so when I formulated the problem with the variable being xki, that means how many of the uh, kth order of casting, I will do from hit number i. So that's, that's a matrix that you get of variables. And with the constraints that we had, it's everything linear. The only difficulty here is that xki has to be an integer, because you decide whether to do completely that casting or not. You cannot do it halfway and come back and, and fill it, right? So all these have to be integers, 0, including 0. So that makes it an integer linear program and there are not many efficient ways of handling them. If this was not an integer, then I could go up to thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of variables using linear programming. But integer restriction makes it. In fact, the software I was going to buy to solve it, they said, how many variable problem you want to solve with this? I said, what's that got to do with the cost? Because you're selling me a software, it's up to me how many. He said, no, if, you, if, the, if your number of integer variable is up to 500, it costs you so much. If it's up to 3,000, it costs you so much, and it's infinite. They don't mean infinite, really. It's more than 3,000, but maybe up to 10,000, you have to pay so much. So they have actually spent a lot of money in doing research in trying to get this software built for integer handling, and they are trying to recover from those who are going to use it. 
Yeah. Can you identify the software? Uh, that's called uh, the binary semantics. Uh, what's the product? Ciplex. Ciplex method. Yeah. So. Uh, so that, that you cannot go, so I'll sh uh, I'm not sure if I have the result. Yeah, here is the leader. So this was the Lingo software that's been used. Um, so here I've got a small problem, 10 heats, and then here I've got 10 orders. So there are 100 variables, okay? This was a piece of cake for that software. So it gave me the right answer. But then I went to 500 variable, and it was waiting on my, I did it quite many years ago, actually. It's in 99, 2000, I think I did that. I waited seven hours for that to give me a solution and eventually gave me a solution, but it wasn't optimum because it was about 70% or 72% kind of efficiency. So this company gave me a problem where I need to go about 17,000 to 20,000 variables. Here we are stuck at 500, okay? Then I used a standard GA, a vanilla GA. Um, they also were a disaster because it's a linear problem and we are trying to use a very generic optimization algorithm to solve it. So uh, it was out of question. So then we customized the GA. Because it's a linear problem, one of the properties of linear system is, is that you've got two good parts from different parts of, the, of the, uh, the variable vector. If you combine them into one, you expect a better performance. So that's the properties of linear systems, right? Uh, so you, you, it may still become infeasible, so you need to, you need to you know, make it feasible if possible. But if you can make it feasible, then you can get a much better jump, right? So it's ideal problem for a crossover operator to be used. And here is the algorithm performance for a 2,000 variable problem. Remember, we're stuck at 500. Uh, and I'm doing a population size study here. So uh, if you have a very small population, like here I was using four, of course, it doesn't work with that efficiency. But still, I've got close to 95% with the variation that comes from my running it a few times. Uh, then as I'm increasing my population size, the algorithm improves its performance and gets to the optimal performance at around 20 population size. And then it doesn't matter if you give it more than what is needed, it will do equivalent. Only thing is it'll take more and more time to solve it. So this kind of study is needed again when you have an algorithm and you are giving it to someone who do doesn't know about the algorithm. You need to come up with a critical population size after which it starts to work, below which there's not enough sample for the algorithm to process all that information. So such a study is needed. And once you've done that, you've got a nice sweet spot. And, and we recommended them to use 30. So we just don't want them to be at the blink of not working and working. So we used 30 population size. And they were interested in about 15,000, 16,000 variables here. So that was fine. And, and it was taking about 10 seconds uh, with our computer then uh, to, to find it. Now it takes even much smaller time. Uh, but out of academic interest, we go and solve a million variable problem. Because this problem, you just say that I have lots of more orders that to solve. So it goes in for days to solve it. But the problem scales up. Uh, so we went up to million variables simply because of the computer uh, memory restrictions that we have. I'm resolving it now at MSU. And pretty soon, there should be a paper with one billion variable. Probably the first time anybody had solved an optimization problem with billion variables there. But it's scaling up, up to billion variable. That's very interesting. Uh, so here, I'm showing you the results that with 30 minutes, uh, we solved. Now, I presented this work in a computer science related conference. And there was a smart PhD student sitting and said, hey, your problem looks knapsack problem. Okay, when I gave the formulation here, this is a knapsack problem, actually. A knapsack problem is known to be NP hard, which means you cannot find a polynomial time algorithm solve this problem. And I'm showing you a polynomial time performance. Okay, As the number of variables increase from 100 to 1 million, my clock time is increasing in a polynomial manner. Okay, uh, The trick is this. None of these points I'm claiming to be optimum. Okay, So I put a restriction that each one of them, if you get a solution with 99.7% or more metal utilization, stop. Okay, So think about this now. There's an optima at every variable level here. There is an optimum. But that optima lies between 99.7% to 100% somewhere, which I don't know. So you can get a very fast algorithm to get very close to the optimum. But if you're really interested in the optimum, you need to spend that exponential time. Because there are only very few solutions, which is better than this 99.7% to the optima. And you spend exponential amount of time in getting there. Are you interested?
in that. So for most practical purposes, we have lost maybe from the optimum about two, ki two kilograms of metal not been properly uh, scheduled. So that's, my, that's what we have lost in a 650 kilo vessel. In fact, the company says, give me a 90%. I should be happy because they were struggling with 70%, 75%. So that's the message I'm trying to say. The problem may be difficult if you're interested in the optima, the true optima. But if you're interested in an approximate solution, you may find some methods that are very fast and that serves your purpose. And, and then, then you are done. So in that case, thinking of algorithms that, that is uh, like more has this recombinative power that can give you this kind of advantage can be at, at your benefit. Okay? All right, so I do solve practical problems. I sometimes also try to look at from a theoretical point of view in order to get attention from the mathematical optimization and operations research people. Uh, to pay attention to what we are doing. So recently we have worked on getting the KKT, proximity, the, the KKT optimality conditions, which are theoretical optimality conditions, to say something about our solutions, how close they are from the optima. So when we look at the optimality conditions, we figured that if we reframe the problem, if you relax each of these KKT optimality conditions, the relaxation comes here with this epsilon parameter. So we're saying we're going to minimize epsilon so ideally, this should be 0. This should be 0. But we relax it in a way. And there is a theory that goes like four page mathematical proof of what, what's, how this relationship comes about. But if you do that and solve this problem for every known solution, so, so you're running your GA, let's say. At the end of every generation, you've got, a, you've got your best solution. That's your XK. And now you formulate this problem, which unfortunately requires you to compute the gradients, because anytime you use optimality condition, you have to use that. But it's not, a, it's not an unknown solution. You know the solution. If you can compute the gradient, you can solve this problem. And the optimal epsilon k gives you an idea of how far you are from the optima without knowing where the optima is. So that's the very nice thing about it. So you can, you can actually track how your algorithm is doing, how fast it's moving towards the optima, which you don't know. But you get an idea of how far you are from the optima. A byproduct you get from these are all the Lagrange multipliers corresponding to all the constraints. Those are very helpful in doing further analysis. OK, so here are some results I'm showing. Uh, for these are, these are test problems that are often used in, in testing a constraint handling algorithm. Uh, there's one thing clear about this is if your epsilon k star is 0, uh, there is no other way but a KKT point can make it 0. There is no other way. So it need not be the optimum. It could be a KKT point, but at least an optimum has to be a KKT point. So you have a very good idea or, or, or confidence that you are close to an optimum, unless it's a KKT point, which is not an optimum. Not all KKT points are optimum. But uh, at least some theory that says that we have a good chance of telling you that you are close to the optima. Now you see, all these problems, these are results from GA, a, a real coded GA, or you call RGA. All of them, starting from the initial population, comes down to 0, comes down to 0. So which actually says that we are not using any gradient. We are not using any KKT optimality conditions. We are using the selection, recombination, and stuff like that. But there's something going on in them that the best solution of my population is going towards the optima. Okay? You can show this if you know the optima of a problem, because then you show how much different you are. But if you don't know in a problem what the optima is, you can use this method. And if your KKT proximity measure hits 0, that means you are on the optima. Anyway, so all these are with single objective, but there are a lot of issues with single objective problems in practice because nobody likes them that the optimal solution that you get is so specialized for that particular objective is that it's often useless for other purposes. And in practice, nobody's interested in one. So it's all actually getting very clear now that, uh, that we should be looking at at least two or more objectives in order to get something that's useful. But then let's look at what happens when you have multiple objectives. So if I take a problem with cost and comfort, for example, there are two conflicting criteria when you go and, and buy a car, uh, you can get a solution that's minimum cost, but not everybody drives that kind of car, right? Uh, so that has, because it doesn't do well in another criteria that you are interested in. And if you are going for that criteria, the best solution, you may find that, which is 10 times more expensive than that. So you get into a trade-off kind of frontier uh, uh, the, 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 the question is that not any arbitrary solution that or anybody can come up with a car 
is an optimal solution. So there exists this entire blue region, which are anybody can come up with a car. It's an entire search space or the objective space here. Uh, when you give me a point, not from the red line here, but, but from the other part, uh, I can always give you a point from the red line, which is better than your solution in all objectives. Okay? So that's why these points are called Pareto optimal points, and our target is to go and find them. Now the question is, shall we find only one, or A, or B, or C, or two, or something else? So that's where the decision making comes in. That's where the stakeholders' uh, interest has to be taken into account. So as an optimization person, what you could do best is come up with a set of solutions which are representative of the whole Pareto front, not just at one end, but the entire front, and then involve decision makers to choose one from it. That's also not an easy task of decision making, but there are some systematic ways you can you can do that. So that's a doomed car that I was talking to. This comes in many different uh, problems of buying a mobile for maximum screen size and, and minimum and, and the maximum battery life. So most practical problems have these kind of features. There are some classical ways of doing it, like weighted sum, epsilon constraints. All of them assumes that you have, you'll scalarize. You will actually convert multi-objective to a single objective. That makes the focus to a particular point on the Pareto front. And when you go and use that, you can go and find that point. The problem is that there was a process of optimization starting from an initial point will take you there. When you change your focus to another point by changing weights or whatever, um, you have to resolve the problem, right? Think about what happened when you solve that problem. You've terminated here. <coughs> Everything with that run is lost, OK? Now when you're solving the new problem, it's a new problem altogether. All these tricks to avoid uh, you know, infeasible region, to avoid local optima, all these tricks that you, your algorithm had to do here, you have to relearn. You have to wait for them to happen again. It's very unlikely that every time your algorithm will pick that up and you will get the right Pareto front. So there is no parallel search. But if you're doing an evolutionary method here, then that means you are having a set of points, and these points are moving together towards the Pareto front one can help the other. If one of the points is moving closer to the parent to front, that can actually help other solutions to move. Okay? So that's why uh, there is a lot of interest on evolutionary methods to find the whole front in one run, not just one by one. Okay, there are other problems with these weighted sum methods. Let's not discuss. So here is the scheme of evolutionary multi-objective optimization, uh, where the problem is given, uh, but you don't go and ask for preferences. You go and try to find uh, a representative set of Pareto solutions, okay, parallelly. And then, once the solutions are there, you can do a decision making in a much better way than if you're doing one by one. So, if you ask without giving the solution what weights or what preferences you have for F1 and F2, it's a very difficult question to answer for stakeholders. But if you go, with, go to them with some solutions and say, can you compare solution one with solution two, because you're giving them a complete solution, right, two solutions, they can then say something with more confidence, and that way you can, you can help choose a solution eventually. Uh, these days, there are methods that are coming up which are interactive, this diagonal step, where um, you don't have to first find the whole Pareto front and then make a decision, but you can embed decision making in the algorithm itself so that this whole process will take you into a shortcut. Okay, so uh, Pat mentioned about NSGA2. I was just counting yesterday, so it just crossed 15,000 Google Scholar sites. It's just taking off. A uh, lot of people are using, taken off rather, a lot of people are using these methods in various fields. I mean, I, I'm looking at some of the citations where it's coming from, not from the computing field. It's from sciences, astronomy, and you know, it, it just went to various different uh, problem areas where people are interested in solving multi-criteria problem. Some commercial softwares have also adopted this method. So here is how it works on a two objective problem. You can see I mentioned to about working in fronts. So this whole set of points is just coming down with iterations. And this is the Pareto front. There's nothing below it. So eventually, if you keep running, it will keep uh, getting their distributions better and better. So at the end, you just have not one, but as many solutions as you want. So it can give you those. Um, very early on, people have tried this concept of finding the Pareto front and showed that there is a lot of merit in this. So this study was done from another Illinois colleague, Coverstan Carroll from Aerospace, and, and she was working with uh, NASA at that point uh, on deciding on spacecraft trajectory. So you want to send a spacecraft from Earth to Mars or Earth to Jupiter. They had done a lot of studies. So they used my NSGA algorithm, which was the precursor of NSGA2. 
And here are the results. Here's the Pareto front for uh, two objectives that they have considered. Actually, they considered three, but I'm showing you here two. Transfer time. So you want to reach there as quickly as possible. And then the other conflicting objective is the mass delivered at the destination target would be maximum. So you want to maximize this and minimize this. So here is the set of trade-off solutions. I'll show you these 44 right here. It takes little more than a year to get there. You take about 700 kilos of mass delivered at the destination. Take the next one here, 73 over here. One year more than that solution, so it kind of makes another round. But then you take about 170 kilos more. So you can decide two more person, but you have to wait one more year to get there. So that's the trade-off. If that's too much of a wait, uh, you could get lots of solutions here with six months of wait, and you can take maybe one more person. So any of them you can pick from here. They're all optimal. But what I want to show you is 72 right there. It's one more year from 73, but there is a three kilo difference from 72, 73 to 70. You can take three kilos more. That even I can say it's not worth waiting one year just to be able to take three kilos. It's in the noise, right? So, but unless you see the whole front, that not much is going on from here to there. There is a small slope. That's part of the Pareto front, but there's not much trade-off. So you should make your decision right here. Okay? So that information only comes if you see the, see the front and some representative points there. This kind of work has made EMO quite popular. Yes, please. Any idea what they actually chose? I don't know, because this was, uh, this was a paper and she was directly working with NASA. So I was, I was involved in helping NSGA talk to their softwares and things like that. I was not even an author on that, so. But I was glad that they used my method. Uh, but then later on, I used this with Indian space uh, research organizations to, to give them uh, a software to do these things. OK. Um, I have also, I'm also consulting with other companies. So here is one from uh, Australia. They are doing this mine scheduling. So again, there are millions of blocks, millions of variables that they have. It's a scheduling problem. Where do you start mining and where do you go? next and so on and so forth. So they have got about four objectives now, four objective capability. They started with a garage with three persons working, one technical guy, and now there are 44 people in downtown Perth as uh, the second highest uh, you know, cell of their software, which does not only just uh, this optimization, but many other things of scheduling and stuff like that. Um, so applications are going on parallelly as the development. <coughs> One of the things that I stress is decision making because most of the academic work still this point is find the parity to front. That's the end of your last page of, I mean, it's the last page of your paper. But I think for practical problems, the interesting thing starts then, right? Because you found a set of parity points. Which one do you choose? Like the question that you asked right now. It's a very interesting question. How do I choose? There are some systematic ways you could do. Um, here I'm showing you some of them. There is a called a, called a compromise programming, where now you restrict your search to only those points that you found, and and look at which of these points will minimize the LP norm. So for the LP norm, you need a reference point. You could do that, or there are other ideas like reference point based methods. So you can choose a reference point, uh, and then go and find only the points on your entire Pareto form that is closest to each of these reference points that you have supplied. So you have to have your algorithm slightly modified for that. Uh, there are other methods like marginal rate of substitution where every point you, you take, you consider on your left and right and see how much you're sacrificing versus how much you're gaining. So that ratio you maximize, sorry, in this case, minimize because <coughs> sacrifice by gain. And then you sort these points according to that and go to the decision maker and say, purely in terms of gain versus uh, sacrifice, <coughs> these are my ranking. And then decision maker can look at it with maybe with other criteria and choose it. Uh, there are some pseudo weight concepts that you can derive. I mean, these are just few that I'm showing here, but there are lots of systematic methods before the actual preference information is used. You could do and, and reduce the cardinality of the set by that way. Yeah. Just as you've absorbed the issue of multiple starting points into simultaneously finding the frontier because of uh, trading information, right. can you absorb some of these uh, posteriori approaches back into the very good idea. Yeah. So, so what you what you're saying is, once you found this, then you run it again with this being the initial set. No, I'm no? saying the criteria. Can you absorb those criteria back into your so that you get trade-offs among the different criteria, just as you did when you had multiple starting points? Uh, sorry, I didn't get exactly what you're saying. So but trade-offs and the, the method that you use to choose. So oh, the methods to choose. Okay, in terms of which method to choose. 
compute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you could do all kinds of things because now that you know these things and if you have a preference information, decision maker came and said, yeah, I like that solution. Uh, in another situation, I like a similar solution. Now you look and you can kind of model the decision maker saying, oh, this is how the decision making is done in this particular problem. So you can then go back to your original al algorithm and use that as a single objective criteria. But there was a learning process of getting what kind of preference information that the person That's is more actually, more yeah, actually I'll show you. <laughs> oh, all right, thank you. Uh, because I got motivated by what I was, uh, I did actually. So this is the interactive method. So, so what I do is every five, 10 generations, I get my current set of trade-off solutions. Like, and then I get five of them. So I cluster them and choose five of them and show to the decision maker and say, do pairwise comparisons and tell me how much, whatever you can. So he may not be doing all five choose two pairwise comparisons, but few of them. Let's say he compares rank one with rank two and says rank one is better. Okay. So once this information are given, I know that what information the decision maker told me, then I go and come up with a utility function that obeys or kind of uh, 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 you know, honors the preference information that the decision maker has given. So once I find that, so here, for example, rank one, this solution is better than this, better than three, better than four, better than five. So you see how the hierarchy comes up with my function. And then, and the way I do this is I maximize the distance between them with that function, how it will come out. And now, after, if this has come after 10th generation, from 10th to 20th generation, I don't use my original algorithm. I actually use embed this information into my selection operations. So, uh, so that's how you get more and more preference based. And eventually, when you run this thing, here is my whole Pareto front. The whole process takes you to one region on the Pareto front because you are guided all, all along. So I think this kind of methods will have more practical use than finding the whole front, particularly if you have a large number of objectives. Then you need lots of points to be found. OK, so that's what we're getting next. Um, yeah, I think I need to wrap up here so quickly. Uh, many objective problem. Many is a name given by, again, computer scientists. But um, they say two and three is multi, but more than three is many. Uh, then I came and said more than uh, 50 is massive. So we are now working on evolutionary massive. But the good part is we're always doing emo, right? Evolutionary. And I'm even saying the single objective is also an emo because it's evolutionary mono objective optimization. So, so one word and everything is covered. Problem comes when you go to more than three objectives is that a large fraction of population becomes non-dominated in your population. So you really don't have enough room for you to do anything there. Okay? So and this is how in my book I showed how the number of points really increases with number of objectives. So something, so if you take a population of size 200, um, if you're doing two objectives, only 10% of your random populations are non-dominated to each other. Those are good solutions. But now if you go to 10 objectives, look at that. About 90% of your population is now non-dominated. So you have only 10% bad solutions in your population. So every generation, you're replacing only those 10%. So it's not a very good search that you have out of it. That's really the main problem in dealing with large number of objectives. Uh, sometimes this problem degenerates into a lower dimensional problem on its own because the objectives and the constraints that you have your problem, one objective gets correlated to another when you come close to the optima. It may not be apparent if you take a random set of points, but when you come close to the optima, they try to show that they're correlated. I have seen some such problems in practice. So there we have a different idea. You could use these kind of methods, EMO with a principal component analysis based method. So every few generations, you do a PCA analysis to figure out if there's any uh, objectives that are correlated. So you can collapse them and so on and so forth. So we have some methodologies for that. But here we're talking about generic problems where we don't anticipate any such correlations. If there is, they will also work. There are other methods like Pat has uh, Borg, MOEA, and then MOEAD. They're also very, very popular methods. This is really the main research area in EMO these days. So we tried lots of things after NSGA2, but most of all of them actually didn't result in a very good scaling up of those methods. Uh, so then we said we need to guide the algorithm. So the way to guide the algorithm is we come up with a set of reference points in a very generic way. And then we say, OK, we'll join the ideal point with the reference point, And we'll have these reference directions that are coming out. All we want now our algorithm to go down through these reference lines all the way to the Pareto front. So we are providing some guidelines that are well diverse in my search space. Okay? So that's the only help we are doing it. Now, there are various ways to do these things. That's how there are different methods. 
uh, up to certain point it's same as NSGA2 so I'm not going into the details because of time then you need a normalization like these are the lines I was talking to you about we don't know where the parito front is but we know that these lines are going to hit them at some point so if you s make your search preferring points that are close to these lines and also close to the ideal point you'll eventually get to the parito front uh, so there are some details here but let me show you some results so if you're showing the three objective problem three objectives are in conflict here is the Pareto surface this is from a test problem you can see how nice a distribution you can get okay this is a 10 objective problem we are showing through these uh, uh, way and then there are other problems if you want only few solutions to be found the idea still works if you want to find points only in the middle or some part of this Pareto front all you have to do is put those points in that manner your reference points and then the algorithm will go and find those okay so so there are different problems that we solved. Here is a simulation of how these NSGA3, this is NSGA3, uh, works uh, starting from points that are far away. You can't see that how far it's going, but I wanted to show you the idea of the distribution that it gets eventually. Okay, so we took this uh, KKT idea for termination and convergence. We just did it for multi-objective and we have defined, just modified it, so we get this KKT proximity error. Uh, let me not show you all these maths, but showing you what happened? So you see, we came up with a surface now. This is the objective space, F1, F2. Here is my Pareto front. And as you are getting closer to the Pareto front, look at the surface. You are getting parallel contour lines. That means if you have all the points over here, they all have the same KKT proximity measure. If you are here, they have the same KKT proximity measure. Only if you are here on the Pareto front, you get zero. Okay? And here is the result of NSGA2. You can see that the best one, the 25 quartile, the median 75, and the worst one, how they are coming down with this KKT proximity measure. So you say, okay, as soon as I get something at 0 0.01 with KKT proximity measure, the median one, I'm going to stop. So you can then come up with what, what generations is needed. You would have terminated at that generation. So now it's not arbitrary. If we put these things as a termination condition, you have a theoretical convergence. Okay, you are guaranteeing that at least 50% of your populations have a KKT proximity measure of 0.01. Okay, so there are lots of advantages with this metric. Although this is the whole Pareto front, as you see after some 200 generations, you see that most of this part of the Pareto front has almost zero KKTPM. Here is the KKTPM value here, the red lines. But these solutions have large, relatively large KKTPM. Large KKTPM is bad. They have not converged yet. So what's happening here is that there's a Pareto front slightly below it. It's difficult to find. And the KKTPM is a way to recognize those that they have not converged. There is no other way you can really get that information because all are non-dominated. So there is no way you know that this is worse than that. They're all in the same set, same non-dominated set. But when you do this KKTPM, it says these ones have converged nicely. You see very close to zero, but these ones have not. So what we do is we take the worst one, one at a time and do a local search. And so that's going to now improve and its KKTPM will go down and this one will slightly move to its optimum. So if you do this repeatedly, every generation one, you can have a very nice convergence of the whole thing. Right? So, so the theory can help sometimes if you think properly. OK, this is the last thing I'm going to talk about. Uh, I know I'm just crossed two minutes. But uh, I'm quite excited about this idea is the knowledge discovery that I was talking to you about. So innovation. So it's, it's called innovation from optimization. So with two conflicting goals, okay, you are going to have a set of designs that have straight off with your objectives. So in this case, the trade-offs are between the size and the power that it delivers. Okay. I see these trade-off solutions. Now, each solution has some variables. So let's say the armature diameter, the wear that <coughs> is, how many turns you made, what is the wear thickness, and all these different things. Right. So if I now open these boxes, open the top cover, and see all these variables, go from here, there, to there, and all that, as an engineer, do you suppose that they will just randomly move around or there will be some kind of pattern? Knowing that these solutions are not any arbitrary solutions, these are Pareto optimal solutions. There has to be some kind of pattern. Why? Because all of them has to satisfy these KKT necessary conditions for it to be there. Somehow it should show up. Okay? Now think about how important that is. If you have discovered what principles are common to these high performing solutions, you have actually learned how to make a solution optimum for this problem. Okay, so that's the recipe, that's the rule. That's the rules for best practices that can stay with you 
And so next time you're solving it, you could do it much better. So for this same problem, we have actually done, and we found that all these 200 motors that we've got, all of them should have exactly 18 turns. Previously, you, they were doing uh, 10 to 80 turns. So every solution will have a number between 10 to 80. All of them seems to require gauge number 16, not any other gauges. So these are some commonality that all of them have. And having known this information, you can go and innovate a new turning machine that will do exactly 18 turns. So there is no chance of any error. You could just make your inventory with only gauge number 16, because that's the optimum. You can, for any pick torque, you can have a motor with other combinations, but they are not optimal. This study shows only if you have this, they are optimal. So you are actually getting properties of solutions that are optimal. So this can remain as knowledge. We've done lots of problems. Here is a gearbox design problem where we found the module has to be in proportion of square root of the power. So these are, these are thumb rules that come out from this. Once you find the Pareto set and see other variables are not changing much over the entire Pareto set. Only this module seems to be changing in a drastic way. And we find a nice monotonic relationship. Uh, we tried this for some games, and it turns out that if you're forming teams, so there's a game of cricket that we play in India. Uh, it's a, every point is a team with 11 players in them. So we had a 129 player data set, and we are forming 11 player team. There are a lot of rules and restrictions that you, you need to have in your team. So there are two parts of the game that we had optimized for. We get a nice Pareto set. Each team we now look at and see which all um, players are there commonly appearing we found that only 29 of the 129 players are needed to form any of these teams. So that means other 100 players are not needed. So if you make such a study, you can actually get a very good idea. So I was presenting it to a, a bigger conference. There was a professor from India. Uh, he's very well known. He's, he's also advising to the prime minister and all that. So he was sitting on the first bench and he's saying, can I use your method to form my research team? Because he has usually 40, 50 PhD students, like 10 postdocs, and he really needs to use some, some <laughs> methods to find out where he has gaps. So, he, so when he gets all the applications, he can do such a study to figure out how to get the portfolio balanced. You know. So this can give you a lot of insight. OK, let me now skip uh, some of these things, because they are uh, used for uh, different other kind of problem solving. Uh, uncertainties can be handled in multi-objective, both through a robust way or through reliability way. So I'm just keeping some of these things. Just two minutes, I'm going to summarize this New Zealand problem that we solved recently. Um, uh, so this is a problem where there's a land that's owned by Maoris, local tribes over there. Um, there are, this whole land is divided into 350 odd different paddocks, as they call it. So each paddock, you can have 100 different options of what you want to do. And you have 10 years to make that change. Okay? And then they are looking at 14 different objectives. Some objectives come from the productivity, like how much beef, how much saw log, and all that. Some from the environment, that because they are putting chemicals, so this lake that people use uh, are, are getting nitride leached and all that stuff. Uh, the carbon and all that that you have to consider. And there are some societal objectives. So 14 objectives. And it's a huge search space if you look at 100 options in each, sorry, 100 options in each of these um, 315 places, not 50, 315 places, 10 years you can change it. So there are so many different solutions that exist. Uh, just to tell you, there, it's, uh, there, there's, it's a, a huge compared to the atoms that we have in the universe. Um, so it will take lifetime to really do an exhaustive search or even do if you're dealing with not so good algorithm. Uh, so you need to search well. But again, the question is, are you really interested in the Optima? So that comes in. Maybe you can come up with a faster method. But this is what the current situation is. Okay, Here is the lake somewhere. And then these are dairy. And dairy turned out to be not so productive uh, these days anymore. But this is what they're doing now. So we treat it like a 14 objective problem. Uh, but I, when I'm showing you the results, I cannot show you 14 dimensional objective space. So what I'm doing is I'm clustering all the productivity related stuff over here, profitability related stuff here, and the environment related stuff here, putting them together with some weight, weights, and showing you the Pareto surface. I will show you the, um, the maximum environment, the good environment solution, okay, environment friendly solution. These are 14 objectives, how they are changing with 50 years span, and this is how they change. So this is the current scenario, and you see every year they change up to 10th year. 
So it has completely changed from what it was in the beginning. So this is the final, final landscape. And then we keep it for the next 40 years because all the trees that you planted, it needs time to give us carbon. So fortunately, the models were available from the uh, forest department that we are working with there. Okay? So, so that's one. And then if you say, what is a good profitable solution? So we choose one from here. And then I show you the final one. Here are the 14 objectives. They're changing. We need time to go through them. But here is the solution. So if I put them side by side now, uh, you can see that the most profitable solution and most environment friendly solutions, there are a few common stuff. There are a few places they are changing. But one thing you notice, blues have reduced quite a bit because that's not profitable. And that's also not good for environment. Uh, but wherever there is blue, they're surrounded by green because that protects all the chemicals that you are putting over there. None of this thing is told to the algorithm. It comes out to be like this. But the interesting thing was there are two decision makers here. One is the government, who are interested in more of these kind of solutions. And other is the Maoris, who owns this land. They are interested in more profitable solutions. Now, when you show this to the uh, government people, they don't like it because there's so much pollution, right? When we show this to the Maoris, they say, no, this doesn't have enough profit. How can I feed my kids? You know, so what we are going is from here to there, you saw so many solutions, right? So systematically, we are, when we are going to the environment, uh, the, the, the politicians, we are actually starting from here and, and, and going that way, okay? <laughs> and sorry, the other way around. From here, we are going towards that because we start from the Nadi point and go towards a good solution. And for the, uh, for the Maoris, we actually start from this solution and go. And some point they say, okay, this looks like acceptable to us. And they say, this looks like acceptable to us. Then we see, the, are there some common solutions? Fortunately, there are quite a few common solutions they didn't know. So Maoris like this idea so much that they said, this is how we are going to do decision making from now on. The problem is this. Uh, it's a 50 year thing we're doing, right? Today. And we have to assume how the beef price is going to be <laughs> 10 years from now. Obviously, we are taking the last many years of data and then you're extrapolating. Similarly, the bank interest, because somebody has to put money to change these things. Uh, they are not valid after one or two years. So when you're solving these long time standing problems, what you have to do is do your best at this point. Come two years, do it again. Because till that point, you know the numbers again for the next few years, and you have to do this process again. But whatever you have done in these two years stays. So you start from there on. I think this problem needs to be solved, this wicked problem as we call it, needs to be solved in this manner, looking at it, the problem from as many objectives as they offer, involving decision makers in their own place. But in this particular case, this is weird because they would not come to the same table. They would not see eye to eye. So we have to go twice for every solutions to each of these, each of these people. OK, so I'm going to stop a uh, lot of things I've not talked about. But this is currently uh, of, of interest to me. And we're doing research at, at my lab. I called it COIN, Computational Optimization and Innovation Lab. Uh, all these are practical, OK? But I didn't have time today to talk about it. But I hope I, I was able to give you some idea about that optimization can be used not for finding a solution, but also to learn more about the problem. Classical methods, I don't <coughs> ignore. There are a lot of ways we use them in our methodologies. In fact, the first thing we do is use this to see whether we need anything else. Um, evolutionary methods have this ability to get very close to good solutions. And oftentimes, we are, we are fine with that because they are flexible, they are direct. They are population based. So if you have any ideas, you can introduce them in an algorithm. And they also have this parallel search ability. So if you have parallel computers, you can actually use them. Customization, I think, is the key. You cannot just have a vanilla generic method to solve all problems. You need to customize it. Um, I think the multi-objective optimization is putting things together and making this whole optimization popular to be used in practice, because that's what we do. So I think it's quite exciting, and I'm glad that so many of you are interested. Hopefully, you will work in this area. Thank you, and I think I've taken more time than I was given. Thank you very much. So folks need to go. Uh, that's fine, but I take a, a few questions. And sure. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, yeah you go ahead first. Yeah, My yeah, go ahead. What would be the distant variables in the design of the N laws? Sorry, I didn't get it at all. What would be the distant variables when you design the 10 laws, the slide 16 that you showed? Uh, I'm not sure which one you're talking about. Slide 16? <laughs> <laughs> I think you meant the uh, bullet train nose. 
Yeah, ten rows. What are the distinct variables that you will use here? Slide 16 you are saying, right? Yeah. Here in PowerPoint, you hit 16 and enter. Oh, that comes up. OK, so, ooh. Ah, uh, no. Where am I? 16, this one. Is this problem? Yeah, yeah. What, what are the decision variables that you consider? Decision variables here? Yeah. Okay, the shape of this. So I haven't solved this problem, okay? So this was done by uh, the Japanese researchers from the railway company. Uh, so it's the shape of these nodes is what they were dealing with. So all the parameters, so you need some, maybe some Bezier surfaces and those Bezier control points are your variables. But you will have a lot of constraints like you know, when you pass it through wind tunnels, you have to do a simulation of that and find out, you know, what is the objective function that you are deriving out of this. So you need to do a simulation model running to get that information. Okay. Thanks. So what, one of the, I guess, things you highlighted is that the, it's good to have the algorithm to be customizable. But, um, uh, so, so I'm also working on some evolution algorithms. But uh, the thing I have trouble with, um, maybe, understanding is once you have it customizable how, and you customize it, you don't necessarily know that it's going to still work very well on that given problem. <laughs> so I guess I was wondering what your Okay, so that's, that. that's a tricky part. Yeah. Okay, so how, how much do you customize? How do you customize? So the way we have done on the problems that I have solved is try to first understand the problem. So we start with a lower variable version of the problem if you can or lower complexity version of the problem. So if you have an objective function that you are taking 10,000 elements to do a simulation, maybe you reduce it down so you can do things quickly and then you find out if I have two good solutions, okay, so feasible solutions, what do I have to do to make a new solutions that's also feasible? Can I just simply swap variables or I have to do swapping and then do another repair, but then how to do the repair. So it's problem specific. Right. Uh, you don't have to every time make it right, but if it is better than doing it the uh, random way that we do, or SBX, for example, is one way we do, where we don't care about the other variables, we do one variable at a time. In many practical problems, that will not work. So uh, fortunately, every time you could come up with something that is better than the, the vanilla way of doing it. And that's enough, that's enough. So in that, one million variable problem I showed you, um, not every time, so we have a way to fix it. So we are recombining, okay? We take two solutions, hit wise, we recombine. Uh, every hit, we look at which of the, out of the two population members, which one has a better utilization, and we just first put them into the child. So we create a child that way, but obviously it will not going to satisfy all the constraints that we have. But the constraints are linear, so I try to then repair the solutions to satisfy the linearity aspect of the constant, constraints, not every time I can do, because if I have enough time and go into loops and all that, I'd probably be able to solve it make, it, make it completely repaired. But I don't do that. I said, okay, two iterations is maximum, because I don't want to waste time here. But if I have made that two iterations, it's a, it's a good improvement, okay? So there's always a trade-off of how much you want to repair. That means how much problem information you want to put uh, versus the time. Okay? If you're putting too much information, you are acting like a god, right? So you know everything about the problem, you know every problem how to fix, and that could limit of where you can go. But if you put it too less, again, it'll take a lot of time for you to go. So you need to make that balance. So it has to be with the problem context. I know it's not easy, right. there is no one recipe, but at least thinking about it, understanding the problem. So with the NFL theorem, I think uh, we researchers have a good good thing to, to uh, uh, really to know here is that every complex problem or real problem that you have, there's a bit of research that you need to do to find out what recombination, what mutation, what initialization would be best for these algorithms. Okay? So uh, I think that includes the researcher's role into the problem. You can never have one software and say, okay, everyone use this and you will get your best results in the, in the shortest possible time. Uh, it's not possible anymore, okay? So, but if you do research for, so it's not, I'm talking about one problem. Now this casting one, if there's another casting company comes to me for the same, I can give them the same software. It's the same class of problems. And we developed the algorithm for a class of problems. So that's the best we could do. But if I take that and apply this to a mechanical engineering component design where there's a lot of nonlinearity, that method will not work, I know. So I'll not even copy that as, as my starting point, okay? 
Yeah. Um, I guess I have a, a comment on your last example, and I'd like to hear your response to it. Um, you're saying that in a few years, um, obviously, reality will deviate from your assumption, yeah. so you're going to want to rerun Read your optimization. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm a civil engineer, and it's a very infrastructure capital heavy field. So what does that mean for me if we rerun our optimization in two years and we discover that our levy is lower than it should be? Mm -hmm. <laughs> our DM is in um, that's a good point. Uh, and, and some of those infrastructural problems which you cannot change, <coughs> you cannot do anything. So what you have to do is whatever is best available to you at this point, you have to design it for that. Unless you have some adaptability in your design, which can be changed later on, like smart structures or some other ways of changing things later on. But uh, I'm not talking about those problems here. I'm talking about these problems which you know, you originally thought in 10 years you were going to change the whole problem. You have the 10 years to change whatever you have now to the final one, what you think is the final one, and you are still in that process, uh, these kinds of problems. But if it's a, if it's a resource uh, design or, or a problem that it's fixed, you can't change it, yeah, you have to utilize all the information that you have. So again, linking these two questions is, is something that we're doing recently is very interesting is that if you look at most of these structural optimization problems, uh, if you go from first floor to second floor to third floor all the way, you see all these dimensions are reducing right as you go up because that's the nature. It's like a cantilever beam. As you go up, your dimensions will be smaller because it's taking lesser amount of load. I have not seen too many uh, papers where utilizing that information, that problem information, that as an engineer we know it has to happen, um, into the optimization method. We just keep it free, so anything comes. Eventually we see such solution. But think about if you now put that information by force and say this is our problem information, our customization, pretty soon you'll get something very interesting. right? So that's what you're looking at. So we are showing that, OK, now we are going to play like a god and say we know exactly how this should be reduced. Let's say 20% reduction. OK, then we've got too much information put into it, so we may not get to the optima, right? So, so that's the danger that you have. Um, but in answering your question is, no, these methods, unless it's flexible, you cannot, uh, cannot do it later on. So you have to do it right in the beginning, whatever best information you've got. So then the question comes in is, OK, how uncertain is this? All these parameters that I've assumed. Uh, do I have an idea of how frequently they happen? What is the extent and all that? So we are working on this multi-scenario optimization now. And I have a theory about um, you know, a design that would be a contingent design. So if an event occurs only once in a while in the lifetime of that design, and that's really a worst case, like earthquake or some such things, and designing the whole thing for that situation, is an over design for regular situations. So maybe you need some mechanisms by which the design uh, changes itself so that if that situation happens and when, it will become a much more strong design. So is that possible in, in the current problem that you're trying to solve? But in general, keeping that in mind uh, will allow you to solve these kinds of problems. But then you're talking about structures that are adaptable, changeable. Uh, there are possibilities there. But if you don't have that, then of course you have to assume it fixed. All right. With that, thank you very much. All right. Thanks a lot. Awesome as a gift.